please welcome Jerry McGovern. So, I thought I'd start with a video, because people like videos. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't seen a video in days. So, you know, put this video together. And uh, you might wonder, well, what, what's happening here? You know, these are different people. And, and first person went to travel, and here's the second person. They're going to travel as well. So travel must be popular, right? Let's, let's create more content for travel. And they're going up and down the navigation a lot. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, if people are focusing on your navigation a lot, is that, is that good? I mean, if you were driving down the highway and you were focusing a lot on navigation, and you know, that wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. You'd probably crash a bit if you were focusing too much on the navigation. So, so what's actually happening here? Well, we know that people are clicking on travel a lot. We know that that's actually happening, but we don't know why it's happening. So we have an awful lot of statistics connected with the performance of our websites or the performance of um, our applications that can give us useful in insight, but we don't necessarily know uh, whether they're good or bad. If people are spending a long time on our pages, is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So we need to combine the what with the why. We need to have some sort of a context, at least some of the time, is, well, what were they trying to do? Because when we understand what they were trying to do, that video makes a hell of a lot more sense. So let's say that the task those four or five people were given was, uh, are there any special documents you require to visit Canada as an Irish tourist? So now you know, oh, they're clicking. They started their journey, their customer journey, on by going to travel, which seems quite logical, seems quite, quite reasonable, doesn't it? Except that when we worked with the Canadian government, we said, well, what do you, where do you expect them to go? What's, what's the expected journey? So you, you define the expected journey. So here's the task, and here's the expected journey. Here's where we expect them to go. We expected them to go to immigration. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, immigration. Um, there a couple of months ago, I was chatting to a friend, and he said, what's up? Uh, and I said, uh, I'm emigrating to Canada on Sunday. <laughs> and he said, you're what? You didn't tell me? I said, yeah, but I'll be back on Thursday. Because <laughs> that's the way people talk, and that's the way people think. You know, it's just a very short immigration. A four-day immigration uh, is, is it's, but still technically you're emigrating uh, to Canada. And then you should click on visit, and then you should find out that if you need a, an ETA uh, or a, a visitor uh, visa and you really need an ETA, and I'm cleverer than you because I know what an ETA is. It took me about 16 hours of reading the content to figure it out. But an ETA is an electronic travel authorization because they didn't want to call it visa because it's too obvious to call it visa. I mean, everyone would know what it was then. Let's call it something that nobody will have a bloody clue what it is. And they'll discover and understand all the intricacies of government, and they'll get this amazing thing called an electronic travel authorization, because there are now new ways of traveling to Canada. You can travel electronically, and you need a special visa if you want to arrive there, not by ship or by plane. Right. So that, that makes sense. It's, a, it's an ETA. Right. So what actually happened? What, people went to the travel site because this is the problem with uh, navigation often. Navigation has two core components, or most words have two core meanings. They can be travel to or travel from, you know. And these are, of course, two separate departments, the travel and the immigration crowd. But from a, a customer's point of view or a citizen's point of view, it's travel, you know, they're traveling. So I look for the link connected with, oh, I'm traveling to Canada. And I see a link called travel. That's quite reasonable. And I end up here. And this is 
uh, an amazing place. Most organizations uh, take up the most valuable real estate on their web pages with absolutely useless content and images. Like what, what this picture, you know, here, you know, why? What's the point of that picture? I mean, that looks more like a Stephen King movie. You know, <laughs> that, that plane is going to go in a, in a couple of moments. Every large organization must have a department of useless images. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Is that the department of useless images? Yes, I'm looking for a useless image that has a plane in it, something. Oh yeah, we've got lots of uh, useless images with planes in it. Oh, good, good, good. W while you're at it, I need another type of image. I need an image uh, of a couple, uh, a married couple, just married couple, with two young children, and they're dancing in a field with daisies and the sun is shining. And why do you need that? Well, we want to sell them a dodgy mortgage. Uh, and we don't want them to look at the actual facts in the mortgage. We just want them to, to imagine a future dancing in a field with daisies. Uh, we, we, we don't do those images. Why not? That's the department of emotionally manipulative images you need to read. <laughs> and do you have a number for them? No, sorry. You know, why do we do this? Why do we? put this sort of stuff on, on websites. We just feel, oh, it's a page. We have to put an image on the page uh, in the process. And that's the guy saying, I missed my flight because of that bloody ETA. I couldn't find it. You know, so maybe, maybe it has some function. What they really should have clicked on was immigration. And then they should have gone uh, to visa, those, the visit, those silly people. Instead, they clicked on uh, travel. And if they came to immigration, they would see another amazing picture. I mean, that's total Canada. Where else in the world has a lake, a forest, and mountains? Could only be Canada, right? <laughs> and then it says, then you've got, with, with every useless image, you must have useless content. I mean, here's a bit of useless content. Find out what you need to visit Canada as a tourist or a business person, how to extend your stay in Canada and documents, and et cetera, et cetera. But we're not going to tell you. Yeah. We invented the web so as we wouldn't have to write crap like that. <laughs> I mean, that's why we invented links, so as we could link them and say, hey, get the stuff, right? It's basically. You know, this sort of stuff kills people, this content. And yet we created uh, again and again and again. And then we say the leniency period. Oh, that sounds exciting. The leniency period for the ETA allows you to travel on board. And it ends soon. We're not going to tell you when it ends. We're just going to tell you it ends soon. <laughs> Digital. Your website is not a murder mystery, <laughs> right? The best website is, it's John, he killed her, he's behind me, <laughs> right? That's, that's good web content. You know, we, we, we don't want a Steven Spielberg. We just want to get straight to the point in the fastest possible process. So anyway, back to the leniency period, because I am so excited now. I really want to find out when the leniency period ends. So I click on that link, and I get to the help center. Oh, that's always a dangerous sign when you end up in the health cent help center of any uh, website. So I scroll down, because I see, oh, electronic travel au authorization. I scroll down, and it's the leniency period again. Right, what's happening here? I click on it, I'm back in the health center. There are hundreds of Irish people stuck in Dante's Inferno, the several circles of hell, going around clicking on the leniency period. They've got long beards. They haven't eaten in weeks. They, they'll never get to Canada. You know, why do these things happen? Because we never observe real people using our websites, doing real things things. And when we measure real people and observe real people, we see these sorts of problems. And we say, what can we do about these problems? So I showed all this at yeah, a big conference, a big workshop for Canadian government. 
and the Department of Emigration, uh, which was uh, basically, you know, one specific division, gov Government of Canada, citizen Citizenship and Emigration, were at one table, and the Foreign Affairs were at another table, and they'd never talked before, because they never felt they had anything in common. And then they said, wow, you know, we've got a problem here. How do we solve it? How do so they got together. They got together for the first time that they had, in 10 or 15 years of the web, they actually got together both these departments. And it's not a radical change, but now if you go to travel, there's Visit Canada, which doesn't belong to them. It's not their link. It's an emigration link. It's over to the emigration side. But they're trying to solve the problem of the citizen rather than solve the problem of the department. And often that means uh, collaboration across silos or across divisions. But this is what happens when you actually manage the experience, when you measure the experience of real people. You begin to see what are the core underlying problems and how can we solve those problems. So imagine if you had a metric that measured success of critical customer tasks over time. So this is a, another Canadian example. So we have, a, we have a story that we can tell to management. In spring 2014, people trying to find passport service uh, locations had a 93% success rate. That's good. Wow, by summer 2015, it had dropped to 53%. That's bad. By Basically, spring 2016, it got, had gone up to 100%. Wow, that's good. What happened? Innovation happened, right? Innovation, cool news. They introduced interactive mapping because they said that shows how cool and innovative we are. Uh, you you want to find a passport service location? We're going to show you 365,000 of them all around Canada. You could go anywhere and we'll have red dots and, and pinky dots and all sorts of dots that people are just going to be stunned and amazed and tell all their friends, I never knew they had so many passport service locations in Canada. That's amazing. You know, I live in Quebec, but maybe I'll drive for two and a half weeks to Vancouver and drop <laughs> off my passport service locations because now that I've seen this amazing interactive map, that's what I want to do. You know, People couldn't find their nearest passport service location. Too cool, too innovative. You know, so what was the solution? What got 100%? A simple box, right? No interactive maps, just a box where you put in your zip code and it gave you one answer the closest passport service location, because that's what people want, right? But if we weren't measuring this, this is what the organization would be doing, because this is what's cool and innovative and pushing boundaries. More often, it's pushing people over the limit of their patience and their sanity of trying to do basic things. Similar uh, things in, in um, Norwegian Cancer Society. They had this uh, website back around 2012 Lots of saying, uh, donate and give us money, et cetera, et cetera. We did an analysis on what do citizens want. They didn't want to give them money, unfortunately. They didn't want to donate. That wasn't the number one reason. They basically wanted to know very quickly about key cancers. But of course, they uh, also felt that they needed to create these interactive maps, et cetera, of the body. It was really cool. They invested a lot in it, et cetera. And, you know, but it was major progress because they were focusing on the, on the core things. So that's in 2013. This is 2017, right? They're going backwards. They're going backwards to the core. They're going backwards to the essence. And you know what the core and the essence of all this is? The link. The most radical innovation, the most important development in the last 25 years is the link the most understated, uh, least focused on, most revolutionary thing is the link. There would be no web. There would be no conference here without the link, right? And it is the power of choosing the right links that has the most effect in, in my experience over 20 years of, of doing this. So they went to simplicity 
because nobody was using the interactive uh, bodies. A lot of the coolest stuff is not being used and it's not useful. We need to create innovation that's actually useful rather than that which feeds the ego of our senior managers. Although I suppose we need to do that a bit, otherwise we'll be fired. But you know, it's a balancing act. And you know what happened? Their donations, when they stopped asking for money and they focused on helping people figure out whether they had cancer or their children had cancer, people said, hey, this is a really useful website. I think I'll give it money. I think I'll support them. Solve the customer's problem, they'll solve your problem. Right. Focus on their experience, you'll enhance the organizational experience. So here's the model. We figure out the critical tasks that our customers, what I call the top tasks, need to do. And we measure two things. Their success rate. So we come up with examples of these, of, of getting an initial price to buy a car, et cetera. So we come up then with a good example of that. And then we say, uh, we measure with real people who want to buy cars, and we say, well, 40% of them are failing to, to complete this task. So that's the first key metric. And then the other is how long, of those who are succeeding, how long is it taking them? And the basic model is you bring up the success rate as high as possible, and you reduce the time and task as low as possible. And if you do, do those two things, good things happen. Customers buy more, customers uh, are more loyal. These are the key metrics of the customer experience. So I'm going to bring you through the steps of basically how you know, we do this. There are many, many models, many different ways to actually uh, measure the customer experience. This is just one that I call the task performance uh, indicator. And these are the basic steps. I'm going to go through each, each one of them. So the essence as many speakers have spoken uh, about over these two days, is time. Saving people time today. People are stressed, people are overworked. If you can make it easier, if you can make it simpler, if you can save them time, you can create powerful value. People's time is affected, not in seconds, in hundreds of milliseconds. The top organizations in the world, the Googles and the Amazons, they think in hundreds of milliseconds, one tenth of a second. At one tenth of a second, customer experience is affected. Not at a second, at one tenth of a second. So Amazon and Google are obsessed in one tenth of seconds in their uh, environments. At a second, people are getting annoyed. At three seconds, if they have an option, if they can move away, they will be moving away. So the game is in time, in reducing time. And it's not just about the physical performance, which Aaron talked about earlier, a, a brilliant talk on how to uh, improve the technical performance. Most of the time is wasted when you arrive at the page, reading and looking at stupid images that have absolutely nothing to do with your task, that are getting in the way. You have to scroll down the page. You've already lost four seconds. The page downloaded in two seconds, and the useless content at the top of the page has cost you four seconds already in scrolling down to try and find the stuff that's actually useful. You need to measure two components of the time. The time it takes the page to download, and the time it takes to actually read and use the page itself. So time is also relative. What was fast 10 years ago is slow today. So time keeps being compressed. If you look at e-commerce delivery times, in 2000, a week, hey, that's not bad. But by 2010, two days, ah, yeah, that's, that's much better. And today, Amazon can deliver often in an hour. So what was great, you know, really fast 10 years ago or 15 years ago is now really slow. So time is constantly changing in its perception of what is fast and what is actually slow uh, in, in the environment. So key, the success rate, but increasing the success rate gets you on the football pitch. But to win the game, you've got to reduce that time. You've got to manage that time as well as possible. So choosing tasks. So we have found, we've uh, worked 
in many, many areas, hundreds and hundreds of different areas, whether for governments or for Toyota or, or for you know, uh, Cisco or for Microsoft or IBM or Ikea or BBC or Rolls-Royce, whether it's building aircraft or buying stuff from Ikea or, or uh, w watching the BBC, that there are eight to 12 core tasks in any environment. If you're dealing with your health, there's tasks like check symptoms. If you're buying a car, there's tasks like service costs. There's no more than about eight to 12, what we call top tasks, really crucial tasks that if they're not working well, they have a major impact on the customer experience. So if you can identify these eight to 12 tasks, you can really understand, is this environment working well or not? Uh, in the process. So first steps, you seek to identify these eight to 12 tasks. This is the OECD, who are a, a statistical organization based in Paris that helps countries compare each other on their education systems, etc. So we went through a task identification process and we came up with country surveys, compare country statistical data, because that's the essence of what people want to do with the OECD. So we got our 12 tasks. So we said, these are the 12 tasks. Uh, uh, we had two from the top two because they're so important that we're going to measure and we're going to try and see, uh, are people able to do these things? How fast are they able to do these things? So you got your eight to 12 tasks. So this is the foundation. Your eight to 12 uh, top tasks. Next, you need to get customers that you're going to measure because you're going to give these tasks to actual customers. What we found is that to deliver reliable management metrics, you only need about 13 to 18 people to measure in this specific model. Now, in traditional usability, it's long been known that if you measure with between three and eight people and there's a core problem on, in your application on your website, that problem will become visible. You only need to measure with three to eight carefully selected customers. That's great. You will be able to say, there's a problem here at this part in the process. But you won't be able to put a number on that problem. You won't be able to say, that's resulting in a 40% failure rate. But if you go out to about 15 people, you will begin to get stable metrics of success and time. And what that does is it transforms it from, oh, there's a problem here, to this is causing a 40% failure rate. In other words, 15,000 people a week are failing to complete this task. Now you're in management speak. Now you're in a different environment. So you only need to go out to about 15 people to do this. We have measured over the years hundreds and thousands of people and done hundreds of studies. And what we noticed is that here's uh, with two or three people, you see lots and lots of variance. But as you go up to about 13 to 15 people, the scores, the success rate, or the failure rate begins to stabilize. So even, it's, it's rough, even if you go out to 25, there isn't all that much refinement after about 13 to 15 people in the process. So you can carefully measure 15 people with 12 tasks, and you can get statistics that you can report to management and say, we've got a 60% failure rate in this. It's taking five minutes. It should only take a minute. And then you measure again in six months, and you say, the improvements we made, now it's gone up to an 80% success rate, and it's only taking three minutes in, in the process. So you've got your tasks. You've got, you've got your task areas, you, like compare country statistical data. You've got your customers. Now you need to create actual examples or instructions connected with those tasks. So let's say you've got a task like compare country uh, statistical data in the, in the OECD. How do you actually come up with a measurable thing? Because you can't, it's not measurable just to say to somebody, oh, compare country statistical data. That's useless. That's, you can learn nothing by measuring something like that. You need to create something that's very concrete and specific. And often the best way to do that is not to start 
with the, the task area, but try and go to the, where there might be answers to this task. So when we knew this is the major task area, we started going into the OECD comparative data sets and says, what sort of data sets have they got? Where could we develop interesting tasks from them? So we found uh, health comparative data sets and we found, oh, they've got uh, um, statistics on heart attacks and they've got uh, 30 countries and the Canada and France are in them. Oh, maybe we could create a task like did more people have die of heart attacks in Canada than in, uh, than in France in 2004. That is a measurable task. You give that to real statisticians and policymakers who come to the OECD, and then you observe, did they get the answer? Where did they go? Where did they get lost? What was happening? So often, the best way to create these tasks is start with the answer. Dig into your data. You got your direction, country statistical uh, data, and then you dig in and, and, and try and find uh, examples based on the data sets that actually exist. Another thing, representative and typical. You're not, this is not an exam. You're not trying to come up with something really complicated and hard to do. Oh, they won't be able to do this. You, you try and come up with something that should be easy to do. It's your most popular product. It should really work. You know, because if you've got problems with your most popular product, your most popular example of you know, downloading software, then you've got real problems. So when we worked with Cisco, downloading software was the top tasks of uh, network engineers. So we came up with a task called download the latest firmware of the RV over 2 router. That's one of their most popular routers. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward task. We didn't try and find a really unusual piece of software. We said, hey, let's find a typical thing that is you know, doable and fixable. You know, a normal type of task. It's not an exam. This is crucial. Repeatability. Every six months in Cisco for five, six years, we measured the same task. Download the latest firmware of the RV over 2 router. And in 2010, when we started it, it was 15 steps and 280 seconds. By 2013, it was four steps and 40 seconds. Because we kept saying, hey, we could save time here. We could get rid of a step here in the process. We were constantly ma managing and measuring the same task over time. And then we could see, is the environment improving or not? So repeatability. OECD uh, task instruction in 2008 was Vietnam in the list of countries that received official development assistance. In 2013, uh, in 2012 was Vietnam on the list of countries. The, the same task, slight little change just in the year. If you can get repeatability and constancy in the task, then if the performance changes, it must be because of some change in the actual environment itself. So measuring the same task over time is a powerful way of understanding is the environment improving or not. So hidden clues. When you give this task to the customer, they become like a Sherlock Holmes. So th they look at everything you give them, every instruction you give them, and they examine that. And they'll try and parse it and take little bits of it and put it into search. So one of the number one mistakes in user testing is the construction of the task instruction, that it contains hidden clues that help people in invertedly to, to actually get to the answer. So it's, it's what I call the opposite of search engine optimization. You know, in search engine optimization, you're trying to get exactly the phrases you know, that, that will bring people to the site. Here, you want to make sure you create an instruction that if they cut and paste it into Google, it won't bring them immediately to the right page. So you try and de-optimize the, the actual sentence, the instruction. So here's an example of a very a bad instruction for an internet, find the maternity leave policy. Because it's called the maternity leave policy. So then people are going to search with maternity leave policy in the search. Here's a better way to do it. Your colleague is pregnant. How many months can she take off? 
Right? There's no leading words in that. They can't use anything in that construction to help. They know what to do, but there's nothing within the text that gives them a help to get to the answer really quickly. Because you don't want to be artificially uh, influencing the journey of the task by words that you use within the actual instruction. So no hidden clues. 20 words or less. Remember, you're giving this instruction to somebody. Uh, it's going into their short-term memory. You don't want them constantly having to reference back to the task as they try and solve it. Because then you're disrupting their flow or the natural behavior that's actually uh, occurring uh, for them. So you want an instruction that is as short as possible and that embeds into uh, the short-term memory. And they often say about that human attention span is actually uh, getting shorter now than, than goldfish. Goldfish have a very bad reputation. There's actually no evidence that goldfish have poor attention spans out of 100 years of scientific research. Right? There's zero evidence. The poor goldfish you know, have been discriminated against for the last 70 or 80 years. They've got perfectly good memories. Thank you very much. You know, so leave the goldfish alone. Anyway, customer journeys. You've got your task instructions. Right, so you, uh, download the latest firmware for the over to, RV over to router. So now you need to create the expected journey, the journey that you expect the customer to go on in the process. So this is for NetApp. We create and expect, oh, so this, find a document that gives you the 10 key benefits of using NetApp Snap Vault. So we expect them to go here, click on products, data protection. Uh, net, there's a journey. Of course, there are many journeys, but this is the optimal journey that the organization thinks. Under optimal conditions, here's where they should go. This is what we have designed for them. This is our best idea of their journey. So you've got an expected customer journey, and then you can measure, does the expected journey match with the actual real journey in the process? So you've got this is another key thing that you should create in, after you've uh, created your task instructions. Also, what you need to establish is a target time. Because how do you know that five minutes is good or bad unless you have some expectation of how long it should take? So if you are saying, oh, change your password. You know, so change it. You've forgotten your password. Change your password on the site. Right. You need to have an idea of how long you expect it to take for people to change their passwords. So how would you build up that? Well, one of the ways is you could build it up from the expected customer journey. So, oh, 10 seconds for each page or et cetera. That would be one input. Now, another input would be to go along and see, well, how long does it take uh, on Amazon to change your password? How long does it take on the top websites? There are many models and inputs into a target time, but you need some concept of a target time for your task, because otherwise, time it's, it's very no, whether it's a good or a bad time in the process. So you need to establish target times as well as customer journeys for your tasks. So the measurement setup. So you've, you've chosen the task areas, your top tasks. You've chosen, you've, you've identified, oh, we want to measure with 15 sales reps. They're our core audience, et cetera. You've created your task instructions. You've created uh, your customer journeys. How do you actually do this? Remotely. Remote, using WebEx, using GoToMeeting, using Skype, anything that allows you to share screens. Remote measurement is faster, cheaper, and better than lab-based testing for the vast majority of customer tasks. Why? Why is it better than the lab? Organizations say, but we spent 100,000 on a lab. We bought all this equipment. It must be better. We've invested in this. Yeah, so you bring somebody into your lab and you say, hello, Mr. Rat, come into our lab. <laughs> you know, you're our lab rat. 
Right, and you sit them down at a computer and you say, just feel comfortable. Yeah, we're not really watching you all that much. Uh, you put their hand on their shoulder and you say, pretend you're at home. You know, pretend there's nobody here. There isn't a two-way mirror. Those cameras aren't looking at you. It's your computer. Just, just pretend you're at home. Wouldn't it be better if they were at home? You know, wouldn't it be better if they were in their office, you know, using their own computer? It's more natural. The problem with so much measurement of people is that we create artificial environments for them. And when they're in artificial environments, do you know what they do? They behave artificially. You know, they don't behave the way they'd normally behave. So we're seeing patterns coming back that are false patterns. They're not real patterns of what they really do. They're patterns of what they're doing. My God, I, I'm a rat. I better perform well or they'll electrocute me. <laughs> you know? So that's a real problem with lab-based testing. And remote testing, at least you're not there. They're in their own environment. So, and, and of course, with remote testing, it's far easier to get people. You know, they're much, they'll give you half an hour, an hour. If they have to come to your lab, they've lost a morning in the process. So you can get far more people, far more regularly, far more cheaply, and it's better. Remote testing is the way to go for the vast majority of this sort of stuff. So the skills required. There are two contradictory. So you're, you're watching. It's, you set up a go to meeting. You say, ring at three o'clock, uh, etc. So it's just you and them in the process. You could have your team sitting in on the meeting as well, you know, but they, once they say uh, quiet. So what are the skills of this? Empathetic, for sure. But the biggest skill is actually analytical, observational that you see uh, the patterns. Often, empathy is a double-edged sword. When I work initially in training people in doing this, uh, often the most empathetic people find it the hardest to do this sort of testing. Because the key um, attribute or the key skill of doing this is to shut up. You know. <laughs> Do not give hints to people. Once you know they understand the task, to disappear into the eater. Because you want them to forget that you exist so that you're getting as close as possible to the normal customer behavior. So often, too much empathy. Oh, that, well done, that was great. Well, what are you going to say after the task that they fail? You know, you need a, a really flat, non-engaging uh, voice uh, with them that is neither excited nor dull, etc. It's very difficult to create a sense of calmness and invisibility. That's the best skill you can actually create in doing this. You must know that they understand what the task instruction is about, and you must create that clarity before they start. But otherwise, you want to be quiet. So what not to do? People say in traditional usability, talk aloud. You know, oh, it's good, talk aloud. But if you ask people to talk aloud, it changes the dynamic of their psychology. You know, I would click on and then I would click. They're going to behave differently. And many studies have shown it. You know, I would do this because they're performing. They're not, they're not, per they're performing on a stage for you by telling you by, and, and then they end up doing things that they never normally do. So talk aloud can work in very early product development type environments. But if you're more in established areas, don't ask them to talk aloud. Say, just behave the, your normal way. Do whatever you want to do. So no guidance, no hints. You're not there to help them in the process. You're there to become invisible once you understand. And things, remember, this is remote. It's over the phone. No, no loud breathing. Make sure you test your setup before you measure. Because you could have your, your cat, or sometimes you're typing notes, and it's really loud from their point of the view. So your setup is very important. And oftentimes, it's best to mute yourself as soon as you've given the instruction to go, to go on mute so that they don't hear anything uh, in the process. So you're trying to create an environment where they feel you're not there. You're going to get much better results, much more natural results uh, in the process for that. 
So the measurement sessions uh, themselves, we are not measuring you. See, this is the, the crucial thing. We are measuring the app, the website, so you'll need to spend time at the beginning convincing them. And one of the best ways I found to do that was to say, listen, if you want to give up, please give up, because we will actually learn far more if, where you give up than if you keep going, because you think I want you to keep going. Because people are nice most of the time, and they think, oh, this nice man, I don't want to fail. I'll, I'll make an extra effort. That's the worst thing they could do, because they will not normally make that extra effort, so you will see patterns that don't truly exist. So we tell people, please give up. You want to give up at a, a, a place we learn much more at those failure points than if you keep going just uh, to keep us happy. So we're not measuring you. And then you're looking at, do they succeed? Do they fail? Did more people die in Canada uh, than in uh, uh, France of heart attacks in 2004? The, you need to get the answer for them. They say, they, well, the answer is yes, they did. You know, when they get to the page, they must give you the answer. And then you measure how long did it take them to get that answer. Observe patterns, not exceptions. The professional observes patterns. The amateur observes exceptions. After a while, you get really bored doing this sort of measurement. You say, oh, not the same uh, failure in the search. Oh, they say, oh, look, this person goes to Google, goes to Bing, then goes to the moon and comes back again. That's really interesting. I'm not bored anymore. Yeah, but you get paid to be bored. <laughs> you know, this is not entertainment for you. Don't be looking at the really interesting things that only one in 10,000 people do. Leave the weird people alone. <laughs> right. Just focus on the normal people with normal problems. I know it's boring, but that's what delivers the value. Video is really powerful. The greatest driver of change I have found, of particularly changing senior management, and is to show the video like I showed at the beginning of this session. Here, we've got a 50% failure rate. Let me show you five engineers failing at this critical point. 30, sec 30 seconds, 30 seconds, five. And that represents 15,000 people a week. Video is extremely powerful. You combine that with data. That is the biggest change agent I have found in 20 years of doing this. Constantly releasing these short, edited videos of a range of people failing at a certain point in the task. It creates a great momentum for actually uh, change in the process. So analyzing and presenting the key, two key metrics, the success rate, failure rate, and the time. And the whole model of management then becomes, how do we increase the success rate? How do we reduce the time? Does that, does that uh, uh, change in the technology, will that make things faster for the customer? If we uh, remove this question from uh, the form, will that increase uptake? Will that increase success rate? Manage the outcome, not the input. We spend most of our time measuring what we do. Digital is about measuring what the customer does. That's the shift in organizational models around the world. Stop measuring organizational inputs. Start measuring customer output, outcomes. It's a change in the management model. So here's a little example or a little case studies. The OECD had this task uh, about browsing online publications for free. So we said, what is the title of box 1.2 on page 73 of OECD Employment Outlook 2009? So we hid the intent of the task. Because if they get to page 73, they've got to the free uh, report. You know, we, we try and hide the true intent of the task. 75% of them failed. Why did that happen? So you've got, you've got your metrics, but then you need to explain what caused the failure rate and what can we do about it uh, in, in the process. So 75% failure rate. Why? Here was the expected journey. The expected journey worked fine up until the point of get this book. Right, so we could say the, the early navigation wasn't a problem. The real problems began at get this book. So what happened? Confusing menus and links. It's always confusing menus and links. You know, it, this, it seems so trivial, it seems so obvious, but 
six, seven out of 10 problems that we find week in, week out are because of badly written, confusing, overlapping links. So what happened here with this task was basically uh, we expected them to click on get this book, but instead they clicked on table of contents. You know, that was where the, the, the pattern, that was the dominant journey. So practically everybody got to this page really quickly. And then practically everybody clicked on table of contents. So they clicked on table of contents, then they got here, and they clicked on chapter one. You know, a link gives a promise, oh, chapter one. If most links were married, they'd already be divorced because <laughs> they never keep their promises. Because if you click on chapter one, you don't get chapter one. You get a description of chapter one. Oh, hello, welcome. Are you looking for chapter one? Well, it's not here, sucker. So people would click on chapter one, get a description of chapter one, but not chapter one. And then they'd click back outwards and they'd say, oh, it's probably a big document. Oh, a PDF version. Oh, I'll click on PDF version. They'd click on PDF version and they got to the statistical annex. Yeah, I was looking for the toilets. I ended up on the building site. You know, you know how did I get to the statistical annex? You, you learn fundamental issues of web design in basically the link should always be the destination, not the format. Right? You can have the format in brackets, but the, the link is never the channel. It's always the thing that you want. Great links are very specific. They are not about formats. They are uh, about you know, the, the 2009 Outlook report. PDF version is not a good link right, in the process. So anyway, people lost time, but they didn't fail. So the, you're, you're presenting this sort of results, explaining and saying, here's what happens. Here were the dominant patterns. Here's what caused the 75% uh, failure rate. So they'd come up, they'd come back up, and they would click on get this book. You know, but this is after wasting about 45 seconds. This is where most of the failure uh, occurred. And we have found this in countless tests. If you embed links in the middle of text, it makes them very difficult to understand and to navigate through. Most of the confusion and give up rate occurred at this specific point. And we said, well, here's a possible solution. Right, let's strip them out of their sentences because people are getting really confused at this point in the actual journey. And here's a possible solution. So you're, you're identifying the problems and a hypothesis for the actual solution uh, in the process. Some people did get through uh, those, uh, those links and they got in here, so they're getting close. Right. But this was a problem. Look inside. Again, the naming of, of the actual thing. You don't need to ask somebody. If somebody's cursor, you just need to watch the cursor. If the cursor is going, and then if it totally stops, like the person has had a heart attack, <laughs> you, you don't need to ask them, are you confused? Of course they're bloody confused if they're going around in a, in a circle. And this is what was happening. They were going around in a circle, spending ages, they're buzz, buzzing, around, buzzing around the place. So we knew, hey, there's a problem with that link. It's, it's not clear enough in the process. Right. So then a few did get through here, and they were desperate at this stage. It was like Mount Everest climbing. Up. I'm near the end of the process. Right. But what they do is they want to get to page 73. They put in 73 in the search, and they'd get to page 70. Because PDFs don't pa paginate differently than books do. Now, most of this stuff you never would really discover if you didn't observe behavior, if you didn't measure the actual experience. You, you see the world as the customer sees the world, rather than what you're producing. Oh, we need to get this uh, PDF out as quickly as possible. So these are, you learn things. And of course, you fix it for this task. You fixed it for hundreds of tasks. You develop a policy around pagination, et cetera, et cetera. So you solve one, but you potentially solve Solve thousands of problems uh, in the process. There are underlying patterns that come out uh, as well. So, brought the data back. They didn't solve, but they started experimenting. And, and at one stage, they put in this link, uh, browse this book just underneath uh, the book picture. Because, yes, images in, in, in certain situations can be useful, can be powerful. They can draw the eye for a moment. And people, uh, 
eye was drawn and then they looked immediately underneath for an action. They saw the link draw, they spoke, uh, they fixed some other issues. The next time we measured it was 100% success rate. It went from a 75% failure rate to 100% success rate, not by introducing new technology, not by doing a redesign, but by fixing a couple of links right, in the process. Again, often the core underlying problems are to do with simple issues rather than deeply complex issues. But we don't see these simple issues because we don't observe customer behavior and what they're actually trying to do. What we notice, we've done thousands of these tests uh, over the years, is that in most problem environments, there are two dominant patterns. So if, if I've got a you know, my iPhone or whatever, and I've got a problem with the battery. About 40% of people will think, uh, oh, this is an iPhone 5 problem. The, I've got an iPhone 5 or I've got an iPhone 6. So they'll see the journey from the point of view of the thing that they have, and they'll try to get to the iPhone 6 homepage. That's their journey. Well, oh, I've got a, 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 a Toyota RAV4. What is the thing that I have? So the journey will be from the object, the object that they actually have. So then they'll try and get to that uh, iPhone 6 page, and then they'll look for troubleshooting uh, in, in the process. So the journey will begin with the object that they actually have in the process. So that's a dominant pattern that keeps coming up. And then the other 40% will think from a subject point of view, oh, I've got a battery problem. I need help. I need support. Then I'll look for the iPhone. These keep repeating. These patterns, object and subject, object and subject, uh, keep, are two core dominant patterns that occur across thousands of problem sets. So you've got 40% you know, uh, object, 40% uh, subject, and 20% weird. You know, you can't really design for the 20%, but you can certainly design for the 80% and, and solve those problems. So when we were doing the testing in, uh, in the OECD, we saw some overall patterns. So these were patterns that were not just specific to a, a, a particular task area. They were affecting multiple tasks. These are very powerful. These are macro patterns that are actually occurring. So what we saw was that people think from the OECD either in countries or in topics. So did more people die in Canada than in France uh, of, of heart disease in 2004? 40% of people, I'll go to the Canada homepage, then I'll look for health. The other 40%, oh, I'll go to the health homepage, then I'll look for Canada or I look for France. So these models keep their two dominant patterns. So most of your design must have at least two critical patterns in the design that deal with the object and the subject of the actual journey. And this keep repeating. So when we reported that back, that was one of the key report, reporting findings, this was their old website. Browse, oh, that's a great heading. Oh, browse, I love browsing. But I, I prefer to find, really. If you want to browse, use these links. But if you want to find, and resources for, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And here, uh, don't you love this? Don't miss. Yeah, we know that nobody looks in the right-hand column, which nobody does. So that's why we call it don't miss. Because we know you're going to miss it. But if we put a heading, don't miss, it won't make any difference. <laughs> You'll still miss it. But we'll feel a little better because we can tell the Secretary General that your speeches and activities are under a heading called don't miss. Except we won't tell them that they're in the right-hand column. Right. So this sort of stuff, this sort of navigation, you know, this is probably the old before we did the measurement. This is what happened with the new countries and topics. You know, the dominant, stripping away, simplifying. Your greatest skill in digital is to remove, to take away. Anyone can add. I've never come across a website that got smaller over time. I've never come across an application that had less features but better working over time. They all, glut is the core uh, challenge of, of digital. And this, the OECD, you see, th they've got simpler. It takes real skill and management to strip away 
anybody can add. It takes a real professional to remove uh, in, in the process. This was another area. So we saw two dominant patterns, countries and topics. Went into the countries uh, section. It said, whoa, look, you know, this is the OECD. You've got uh, the member countries. The member countries get flags, right? And they get their own space. Oh, member countries, wonderful. Then we've got access, accession candidate countries, because it's all about hierarchy and ego. The world isn't equal. It's all broken down into these accession candidate countries. And these enhanced engagement countries, you're going to be examined on this uh, later before you leave, so you better know which countries fit into which. And there's even countries that aren't countries. <laughs> They're non-member economies, whatever the hell that is. I don't know. So, this, so when we were saying this to the team earlier, they said, don't touch the countries. Don't touch the countries. It's so political. You know, you're never going to, we know it's a mess. We know nobody can use this, but it's never going to change. It's been like this for three million years. <laughs> okay. We presented the data. We showed the videos to the management, and here's what happened. They said, that's stupid, isn't it? You know, we shouldn't do that. Let's create an A to a Z. What was utterly impossible to change became possible when we showed the evidence of their real customers trying to do real tasks on, on their websites. So you identify those top tasks, 8 to 12. There's no more than 8 to 12 of them. Um, I've never found an environment that we could not define, whether it was IKEA, whether it was the BBC or Rolls-Royce or Toyota, buying a car or whatever, 8 to 12 tasks. You measure with real people over time, every six months, every 12 months. That's the critical component, because this isn't a once-off model. Once-off will only give it so much value. If, if you measure consistently the same tasks over time, you've got a way to compare the performance of the changes that you're actually making. And if somebody comes up with a silly idea from senior management about interactive maps, you'll say, well, the success rate has gone down from 90% to 50%. That was, I love your idea, Mr. Senior Manager, but it's not working. You know, we need to be able to understand what is actually working and not working in the customer experience. And then you measure, you improve, you know, or you try to improve, because you won't always get it right, and then you measure again. You know, we measure, we improve, we measure again, and it's endless. You'll be doing this until retirement. Thank you very much. <laughs>